Hey there, welcome back to Great Quarter, guys. This is episode 75, it's a bit of a milestone for us, and it happens right on day two of Prime Day, so we're gonna do a little bit of Prime Day coverage today. We've got two big guests. We're gonna have Richard, uh, Richard, Gleaning, uh, Richard Greening, excuse me, the Global Technical Director from DDC FBO, our sponsor of the show, and we're also gonna have Glenn Kepke, the S SVP of Customer Success at Forkites. He's gonna bring so a little bit of the Prime Day data, some of the things that we're leading, what he was seeing leading up to Prime Day on the parcel and on the transportation side and how he thinks that's going to play out and even give us a couple of predictions uh, for the end of the year on the retail supply chain side. So that should be very exciting. We've also got a couple charts of the day. We've got you care or not. And if we have time, we'll have another good, the bad and the Anthony at the end of the show. Uh, let me go ahead and take a moment to thank my sponsor before we get going here. This episode is brought to you by DDC FPO. DDC is a process outsourcing company that specializes in freight, perhaps best known for freight billing. DDC recently launched IT outsourcing to help supply chain stakeholders hit development milestones without risking financial performance. Learn more at ddcfpo.com or just wait about five minutes. We're going to have Mr. Greening here to tell you more in a moment. All right, Anthony, let's go ahead and start with charts of the day. We've each got one. Why don't you go ahead and kick us off? Definitely. Ned. So I think we're going to talk about this one a little bit later if we have time, but launching it off with the Empire State Index, of course, the one and only. In addition to our truck stop seven day all in rate for a flatbed, looking at Buffalo to Elizabeth. So in the green line, we have the Empire State Index for current business conditions in the green line here. And we're seeing that there is still steady uh, conditions going on. Uh, we see the latest reading was a 24.3, showing that it's kind of similar to the PMI, where, but anything above zero instead of 50 is indicative of uh, expansion. So we're seeing co expansion, continuous uh, improvement for the business conditions within uh, the New York area. Then we also see those upward movements and those elevated rates for uh, flatbed. Just kind of looking at Buffalo to Elizabeth as an example, um, just to kind of see what activity is looking like moving in and out of that market. No, no reason for worry here with this declining. Does it just kind of show we're gonna have a bumpy path forward? Yeah, I don't think there's too much reason at all because it's kind of like uh, it's a it's one of those diffusion indices where uh, anything above you know zero, not exactly moving downward, but maybe it's just not growing at the same fast rate, but still expansion overall. Right. Well, good to hear. Manufacturing in the Empire State still growing. My chart of the day today it has to be the Ocean Freight Bonanza. This is just unbelievable. Uh, this is the Freightos Daily Baltic indexes indices for all the ones that we have in Sonar. So. Uh, all green. The, I think the big point here is the global one. I think that's your kind of easiest takeaway here is that the global rates, we are comparing this to this time last month. In just the last four weeks, we've had global container rates rise 22%. This is, again, spot rates. That's, this isn't even the cost to get you on the boat. You're still going to have crazy surcharges up in the thousands of dollars on top of these rates. So these are not the true all-in rate, um, but just the direction is what we're talking about here. Uh, while ocean container capacity is at, you know, just stretched to the max Prices keep rising and demand is, is unabating, uh, which we're going to talk about a little bit in Prime Day. Consumer demand remains really strong. Uh, it is Prime Day. We've got some early Prime Day data to discuss and tell. We're going to kind of get some read throughs into inventory levels uh, based on how many sales we're seeing and into consumers based on where we're seeing them buy and also into some of the parcel um, network stability. How are they running through this very busy time? Okay. Uh, now, that wasn't a very happy point. That's kind of a sad point, the 22% global uh, rising rates on the freight, on the ocean freight markets. But this one, this one is kind of fun. And if you, if you haven't been watching the, the NBA playoffs, you won't find it as funny. Uh, but I saw this joke on Twitter, and it cracked me up. And I had to uh, introduce it to you guys to also bring in UPS. So Ben Simmons is, uh, could be one of the best players in the NBA if he could just learn how to shoot the ball a little bit. Uh, he was a complete absence in the fourth quarter of the series against the Atlanta Hawks. Shout out, Frazier, good game. Our Hawks got a dub in game seven. Uh, so he says if Ben Simmons isn't 6'10", he would be driving for UPS. And this guy <laughs> said, don't do UPS like that. They deliver. Uh, <laughs> and shout out to uh, at, li at the life I chose 91 and at Hightower Anthony for making me laugh on Twitter here. <laughs> because it is true. They do deliver. For example, if we look back at the two weeks leading up to Christmas, uh, December 11th through December 24th of last year, UPS delivered 85 and 86 percent packages on time. That is the best of any of the carriers. That was compared to 69 percent and 76 percent for FedEx and USPS. And in March, they're continuing the strength this year. Despite some of the delays we've seen, March on time performance returned to pre-COVID levels for the first time since the pandemic began. Uh, UPS 
um, UPS was at 90, UPS was at 86%, USPS at 90%, while uh, FedEx came in at 75% on time delivery. So just want to make that point. UPS does deliver, and that joke is hilarious. And, uh, and go Hawks. <laughs> it is hilarious. And UPS, I mean, shout out to Bryant Williams and Brandon Smith. Shame was plugged my cousins there working at UPS, but every year, like clockwork, they get flown into these high demand areas. And I'm just like, wow, you're actually like really putting in the resources to these high demand market areas, but it's always good to see UPS delivering. As yeah, well. they, they spend like, they had some crazy videos back at the end of the year last year. They talking about their training program. They spend like hundreds of millions of dollars each year just training people how not to slip, how to pick up packages yeah. correctly. People have their, 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 uh, you know, their, their quabbles with them based on how they've treated small businesses over the last year yeah. or how they've had to you know, put on surcharge after surcharge, but they've just done what they needed to do to keep their, their network running, and it's running really well. They're delivering billions of packages uh, you know, every month, and they're going to continue doing well, and, and they're keeping the economy going. So uh, shout out UPS. All right, we've got our first guest here, Mr. Richard Greening, the Global Te uh, Technical Director at DDC FPO. Apologies for that. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Andrew. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. So you guys just did some research on the impact of Brexit and uh, you know, what, it, what the impact is on the global supply chain. Can you tell me a little bit about the findings? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so we did the research back in uh, mid-February to, to late March, and obviously because Brexit came into effect uh, 1st of January. So we really wanted to see what the effects are after kind of the bedding in period or during the bedding in period. Um, the best thing about the, re the research we did is we didn't want to limit it to one area. So um, we're doing a lot of support now across the whole of the logistics supply chain. Uh, um, um, and and we're, we're really realizing, well, we've always known it, and, but I think everyone knows it. And this research really kind of hit it home is how symbiont everything is. Uh, and when we've, when we've been feeding some back of this research to some of the, the, the different industries that we work with, they, they don't necessarily always realize how, if, you know, if you're a freight forwarder or, or a haulier, how, um, you, how that really, how really are you impacted by manufacturing and retail and e-commerce? Everything is symbiont. And I think we saw that in the results that we, we got. So the research we did, we spoke, to, we spoke to hauliers, we spoke to freight forwarders, customs brokers, 3PLs, retail, e-com. Uh, manufacturers, warehouse and distribution, etc. And what we were really seeing is all of all of the pain points everyone was having. They were all having the same pain points, and they're in the same point pain points with each other. So um, yeah, Brexit did lead to great disruption. I don't think it was quite as bad as everyone thought it would be day one. I think they did what they could do to um, to ease the pain on the first of January. Uh, but it, it's still there are still some teething issues there. Yeah, Richard, uh, that sounds like robust research. Sounds like you guys spoke to a lot of parties there. It's, it's, it's not funny, but it's, um, it's just ironic that everybody's dealing with the same pain points, and hopefully we can work more collaboratively in the future to you know, eliminate some of those pain points. We, we know DDC's reputation for freight billing, and last month I spoke to Chad here on Great Quarter Guys about you guys' IT services, but you have just launched, and really you're really ramping up your customs brokerage-related work. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, it, it, it's similar to the IT stuff. So, so, so what we were saying with the IT things, we, as Chad said, it, we see same, the same pain points across all of our clients and across the different sectors we work in. It's the same point with, with customs brokerage. Um, we, we started with custom brokerage probably four or five years ago properly in the build-up to Brexit. And it started with one or two very big clients that, that understood the, the, the seriousness of what needed to be done in the next couple of years to, to get there. And I think the reason they chose us is they, they knew it wasn't going to be smooth sailing. There was going to be some pain points. There was going to be a lot of changes in trying to figure out what was right. And therefore, they made the decision to work with an outsourced partner like ourselves because it gives them the flexibility to scale up and scale down and be flexible and, and make changes when they need to do it. So we, we kind of built the model with them. And then we, we've now applied that across the board. So we offer it from, you know, small businesses and up. So, and, and you say, it doesn't matter if you're, a, you know, you were saying earlier, like the FedExes and the UPSs of the world, or if you're a, a small business, you will have similar challenges. So Richard, I'm curious on my end, how does that overlap with situations like Brexit or other major distributions in trade? Uh, so I think, uh, I think the answer there, Anthony, is the disruption, right? So be it if it's, if it's Amazon being a disruptor or having Prime Day like we've got what we've got going on this week, any kind of disruption creates ripples. It's like putting a, dropping a stone into a lake. So it creates those ripples of highs and lows. And 
I think the key for anyone is to try and maximize, it sounds almost cliche, maximize the highs and try and minimize the lows. And so I think everyone's doing that. But I think things like Brexit, I think things like COVID, I think the, if you look for the good points in, in, in what's been happening in the last uh, 12 months, really, is that with great disruption, there is change. So you look for opportunity in that. And if you're not having those successes, you should be rethinking your strategy. I think what we're certainly seeing this year is a lot of our clients are, are making more decisions. Uh, you know, we've, we've had clients conversations with some clients over many months and it may possibly even years sometimes. And what we found certainly this year is people now know they've got to have courage in their conviction and, 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 and invest and make changes. Richard, only got a couple minutes here. Tell me about this. We got a big milestone for Brexit next month, right in July. How's that going to impact EDC and your clients? So there's a couple. I'll quickly, I'll quickly cover them off for you. So when when, when Brexit started in January, um, to ease the burden to ensure goods continue to move across the, the borders into the UK and out and out of the UK, um, they they basically did something where customs could move uh, uh, or import controlled and non-controlled goods from the EU without making an entry summary. Um, but it was only delayed by 175 days. So we're now coming up on, on that threshold now with the 1st of July. So what you what we're about to see is a huge backlog of people that have to start fully declaring their goods to, to HMRC, which is the UK government uh, body. So we're going to see a great demand in backlog of paperwork that needs to be put in. Um, but the other the other big impact that's coming and the real change, I guess, to the market, which is a bit more interest to you guys, is the change in it, what is the VAT reform. And, and the two big changes there really is at the moment you can move um, you can you can move goods into the U, into the UK with a with small value. So anything under 22 euros moves without any kind of uh, VAT. Um, um, on the uh, on the charges, that's changing. Everything moving forward is now going to be vatable, and in in order to enforce that, the, it's being put back onto the online marketplaces. So from the first of July, all of the big online retailers and, and marketplaces are going to have to be responsible for determining the value of the goods and charging the VAT to the the consumer and uh, and collecting that VAT when they when they make the payment. So that that's made a lot of the big e-com guys have to rethink their strategy and invest heavier into uh, supply chain. Yeah, watch. A lot, of, a lot of big changes going on over there in the UK and, and in Europe in general. Thank you, Mr. Greening, so much for taking your time. No, thank you so much for the offer. Yeah, we'll be seeing more of you soon. All right, uh, so I was going to do you care or not, nah, but we already have Glenn uh, Kepke. So let's just go ahead and jump to Glenn. If we have time at the end, we will do our you care or nahs. Glenn, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Andrew. Good to see you. Good to see you too, my man. All right, uh, so we're going to play a quick game. It is called Buy or Sell. Uh, very simple. I don't know if you played it with us before. It's just a statement or a rumor or a prediction that I've heard, and you tell me whether you're buying it or selling it and why. So Adobe Sounds Analytics, good. which analyzes transactions from, from 80 of the top 100 online retailers, predicts Prime Day 2021 will be the largest online sales event to date, just barely edging out Cyber Monday 2020. You buying or selling? I'm buying any reason? Yeah, reason is is economy strong, uh, just overall consumer spending. We see it, you know, each week. Uh, volumes are continuing to rise uh, as certain markets and uh, metropolises open up. People want convenience, and you know, Amazon's offering that, and Prime Day is a good deal. So I think we'll we'll see it uh, take off here, and we'll set records. Yeah, I can't disagree with you. We have the uh, the twenty four hour. I kind of I kind of put you in a hole here, but uh, we already have the data for the first 24 hours, and it, is, it came in at $5.4 in sales, according to Adobe. That is their prediction. They say that yesterday's opening day for Prime Day was the biggest online sales day to date in this year so far. That's kind of no surprise. But there was something that I thought was really interesting here, and they say there's actually an even bigger spillover effect, a halo effect, to the other companies that are throwing uh, deals as well. So last year, you look at companies with more than a billion dollars in revenue. They saw a 24% average kind of spillover and spike compared to their previous average on that day. And then if you had less than $10 million in revenue, you saw about a 14% uh, spillover effect last year. But this year, we're seeing 28% and 22% uh, spillover. So I, I think that really suggests to me that there's broad-based demand for consumer goods, not only from Amazon, but from other people as well. There's lots of competing deals to try to go on. Is that you you're taking that as a good sign as well, Glenn? Absolutely, yeah. My prediction is, you know, other retailers will continue to benefit. Uh, we see it with our within our own customer base. 
uh, in our data, one from retailers buying the goods, but also uh, from a supplier standpoint that are shipping uh, goods to retailers. So overall, we will continue to see retail pick up. And, you know, if you think about yourself as a shopper, you know, you may go to one place, get an idea and start to shop around to different uh, retail outlets, whether online or uh, within brick and mortar. And so volumes are picking up. They remain strong. Uh, it does impact the, the freight market, though, uh, as we see in over the road, uh, ocean and air, especially right now. Yeah, everything seems to be really, really tight. Let's talk a little bit about the data, uh, a little bit about Forkite's data. Tell me what you're seeing from, you know, shipments and dwell times. What are kind of some of the patterns you're seeing leading up to this very busy prime day? Yeah, so volume is following a similar pattern to last year uh, where it dips slightly uh, week over week and then it starts to pick up uh, in the last week and a half is what we've seen. So typically there's a, a slight lull right before prime days as uh, the sourcing happens. So it really depends on where products are coming from. Uh, a lot comes from China, Southeast Asia, as we know. Uh, so we've seen an increase in uh, ocean containers, but also air traffic uh, as well that's being imported into the U.S., on dwell time specific to, to road freight, what we've seen is dwell time has increased on average uh, by about 20%. And so that is indicative of Amazon and their uh, very heavy live unload model, where if you look at other retailers uh, like a Walmart or a Target, uh, tend to be heavily drop trailer. And so we're seeing dwell increase uh, over the last week and a half. And the anticipation is we're gonna see it rise here uh, through the end of this week and potentially into next week. So, Glenn, with all this volume, what can you tell me about data around on-time shipments? I see here that uh, on-time shipments for retails were down, or for retail was down 30% during the week of June 13th. What are you seeing on your end specifically around that on-time um, or on-time shipments segment? Yeah, so we see that uh, shipments are being impacted uh, and largely driven by capacity and just overall scheduling. And so, when you think about uh, anytime you have a spike, whether it's Cyber Monday, Black Friday, uh, Prime Day, is there's always a crunch, right? And when you think about the buy side, uh, folks aren't necessarily worried about capacity, right? Because capacity constraints don't really exist. Uh, so we see uh, as the volume continues to to tick up, uh, on-time performance is being impacted. And because it's more of a live unload format uh, with the, the Amazon network, uh, being able to hit those you know, to the minute appointment times is a challenge uh, for carriers right now. Hey, Glenn, uh, it's Andrew again. Hey, team, if we get a moment, we can put up that e-marketer chart of uh, how Amazon, look at this lead. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, Glenn, but look at this lead that Amazon has over the other top 10 uh, online retailers. You're looking at about 90% there, Amazon. If you added up the bottom nine, you still wouldn't add up to Amazon at number one. So I think it's just, I, I'm, I'm making this point to, say how much of an impact that Amazon can have on the overall market despite them handling more than half of their own logistics and half of their own packages right now. You were just talking about how them doing and their live unload scheduling and model impacts the entire market on lead times. Isn't that right? Absolutely. So they have uh, massive impacts on the industry, no different than Walmart did when OTIF came out 10 years ago. Uh, the other thing is you see it in pricing pretty significantly. And so with uh, a day like Prime Day, and the magnitude it has for Amazon uh, in their customer base, you know, it's uh, the budget is less of a focus, and the way that they've grown is continue to uh, grab wallet share in the market, and they can do that because it's been proven, and they continue to be leaps and bounds above their competitors. Uh, that being said, you know, their competitors are growing, uh, as we've seen from kind of the residual effect of consumers maybe not buying from Amazon but going to other retailers, and we'll see that. I think that growth uh, from non-Amazon companies over the next few months uh, as we go into the thick of summer. Glenn, we, we started off the show with a little jab at Ben Simmons and his inability to deliver. And we kind of talked about how UPS is delivering and, and, and is doing a pretty good job, even despite uh, the crazy demand that they're having right now. What are, what are you seeing from parcel carriers? What do you think they need to do to, to keep up uh, with this crazy momentum? I mean, we're going to have a, a massive, uh, you know, looking to be a pretty big holiday season in the back half of the year. Still got Americans with a high savings rate, going to have some extra money to spend. What do you think parcel carriers need to do to keep up? Yeah, so capacity planning, uh, if you look at the, the COVID impacts and uh, what the both you know FedEx and UPS are doing with Operation Warp Speed uh, for vaccinations, you know overall they've done a phenomenal job. So kudos uh, to both companies working as uh, peers in this case to help out the uh, the Americans uh, through a, a tough time. 
So we're, I think we're going to continue to see vaccinations uh, play an impact in capacity. And, you know, as booster shots and other things come in, I think it's going to impact their network. Um, how it relates to retail, it, it just goes back to this. The overall throughput is stretching companies. Uh, they will continue to invest in their networks uh, from an asset standpoint to make sure they can handle it. And, you know, for all intents and purposes, great investment. I think the question mark is, does the economy re remain as strong uh, this year as it will be next year? Right. And that's where the asset heavy models can uh, be challenged is if you forward invest now too much and all of a sudden volume tanks next year, these companies will be in a tough spot. But for all intents and purposes, you know, they're going to continue to grow uh, with the likes of Amazon and many other retailers out there. Glenn, kind of adding on to this is kind of a bit along the same lines, a lot of variables, a lot of unknowns really happening right now. But in your mind, in your perspective, any predictions on what's going to be a long lasting trend versus what is going to be something that maybe retailers or shippers or maybe even uh, people are chasing right now? I mean, we see a lot of people adapting or retailers adapting for trends that are in the moment. What's something that you see as going to be in the moment versus something that's going to be long lasting? So long lasting, I do think curbside type options is here to stay, right? So when you think about the traditional consumer buy habit, it was typically online through an e-commerce website uh, or in-store traffic through a brick and mortar outlet. And you know, even for myself, I've got three boys and I don't have much time to, to spend in stores. And so although I'm impatient and I want my stuff in the next hour, curbside is a great option. And so I do think that is here to stay uh, for the long haul. And it's really important for uh, retailers to make sure that they have a very positive buying experience. You know, the one thing we hear from their customers is that buying experience is key to customer retention, right? So if I have a negative experience at a loyal outlet and I may change my beha buying behavior to go to an alternative competitor. And so uh, that's one thing. Uh, on the short-term side, I just think that the volatility, uh, I think we'll start to see it smooth out here uh, over the next uh, probably month or two. Uh, as we go into the the fall season, and hopefully that will you know turn things into a more balanced freight market. Where today it's very carrier focused, and we course corrected over the last couple of years, uh, but hopefully that will kind of remain or change to be more of a balanced market uh, in the coming months. Yeah, I can't argue with that. I know uh, I got to say there's probably a few shippers sick and tired of paying 320 spot rates right now when when they don't have to be. All right, Glenn, thank right. you so much for your time today. Where should, where should we send people that want to learn more about you or Four Kites? Go to fourkites.com or you can look me up on social media and appreciate the time. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Glenn Kepke, SVP, customer success at Four Kites. All right, got about five minutes here, team. Let's see if we can get through a couple of these, you care or Nas. There, there are a quite, quite a few fun ones. Uh, let's skip the first one here. Actually, let's talk about the first one. So Blackstone Group, uh, a major investment company uh, based, in, based in New York, they have agreed to buy a company that buys and rents single-family homes in a $6 billion deal. That's a sign that Wall Street believes in the U.S. housing market and believes that it's going to continue staying hot. The giant investment firm has reached a deal to acquire Home Partners of America, according to people familiar with the matter. Home Partners owns more than 17,000 houses throughout the U.S., which it, which it buys, rents out. And it does have this kind of offer for tenants to a chance to eventually buy back the house, but it doesn't happen very often. Um, Anthony, what do you think? You care or not about Blackstone getting, into, getting back into single-family rentals? I do. I do. Um, because I don't think this is anything new. I know before the show we're kind of talking about historical trends or some trends that we've seen in the past, especially 08, 09, some of the outcomes from that where we saw lease back programs, things like that. So look at this structure. I don't think it's anything new or particularly innovative, but it is something that might be harmful for some if they're in the wrong position for it. So it might not be the solution for everybody. It's going to be a solution for some. So I'm, I care because I don't want to see people taking the solution if it's not the right run for them. Of course, it's a business. People are going to have to make money, and that is what it is. I mean, that's what this country runs on is business. Right. But um, knowing and understanding what you're getting into and if you're in the right place to take it and not just because you're making an emotional decision at the time. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say I care about this one. I'm, it's, it's really strange. Like, I try to have this conversation. I've been trying to articulate this all day. But, you know, here we have this housing market where we've got uh, existing home sales declining four months in a row. We've got home buyer sentiment tumbling to the lowest on record. We've got this massive imbalance between people trying to buy and people trying to sell. And prices are being prices are at the highest point ever, and yet here comes Wall Street to buy up all the houses, yeah. uh, and it just seems like 
I don't. It just seems like a slap in the face. Like I don't. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to think about it, really. I mean, but it, they're not the only ones. Brookfield Asset Management just, just signed a big deal with, the, um, with another company to do the same. J.P. Morgan um, just signed, signed a couple billion dollar deal to do the same. You know, and the attraction for them is pretty strong, right? If you're yeah. thinking about it, right? They're, they're seeing rising housing prices and rising rents over the next, you know, several years. So it sounds like a pretty good deal. If you could buy an asset, it's going to rise in value and the residual income you can earn from it is also going to rise. Exactly. And I, just from that question that we had with Glenn versus long lasting trends versus chasing, the American people chase. And so whenever there seems to be a shortage, we go out and chase. When there was a gas shortage, what did we do? We went out and chased the get more gas, load up on gas. There's a lumber shortage, there's a housing shortage. All of a sudden, my time point for buying a house is just being moved up because now I'm hearing there's a shortage. So I think American people are in that chase mindset. Haven't learned anything since the toilet paper uh, <laughs> fiasco that happened in 2020. It's just a mindset here. I think that's a good transition to our next one. This is, uh, I don't know if people have been chasing this as much. I've been chasing them at the store. I can't freaking find them. I told y'all there was a very serious chicken wing shortage in this country. It has gotten so bad that Wingstop has created its own virtual online store, and it's called Thigh Stop. I've got a picture of it here uh, where flavor gets its thighs. Uh, Anthony, do you care or not nah about Wingstop changing its name for a couple days? The thigh Stop. Nah, it kind of reminds me of uh, when IHOP changed their name for a little bit. I know it's a yeah. completely different situation. Yeah. But it kind of reminds me of that rebrand. But I don't care only selfishly because I am pescatarian, of course. Oh, that's right. But well. looking at this, it kind of leans back to that cicada. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but you got to eat what you got around, man. That's, exactly, you exactly. Eat what you I mean, it's funny. It's uh, adjusting and adapting. So yeah, I, th I think it's pretty smart. And it looks yeah. pretty cheap, dude. Look at that. They got uh, it was seven ninety nine for three bone in thighs and fries. Yeah, that is cheap. Like that is super cheap. And I love thighs. Uh, it's my favorite part of the chicken. So I wish we had a wing stop here in chat. I would. I would go check it out. All right, uh, we got. 45 seconds, let's go quick. Peloton yes. has launched a new corporate wellness program as it aims to reach new users and grow its membership base. Businesses that sign up will be able to offer their employees subsidized access to Peloton's digital fitness membership and high-end cycles and treadmills. There's a few big-name companies, Wayfair, Samsung, and Sky are among the first businesses to join the program. Anthony, you got 30 seconds. You care or not? Nah? nah, big businesses partnering with other big businesses is cool. <laughs> it happens every day. Eh. I mean, great for Peloton because yeah. it kind of adds some momentum behind the momentum that they already had behind them. So continue to grow, added more benefits to them. But nah, what about you? Well, I'm a shareholder, so I have to care. Uh, <laughs> I do care about this one. I think it's good for the company, the companies that are signing it up, right? You can likely get lower insurance uh, premiums if you have a healthier, uh, a healthier workforce. You can also get more pro productivity at a healthier workforce. I love the idea of workforce doing more to provide healthy lifestyles, whether it be mental or physical. That's one of my favorite benefits here at Freight Waves is our, uh, our gym membership that they give us. So I think that these are great things. I think uh, active and healthy workers make for a better company. So yeah. I'm all down for this. And it's really smart from Peloton's side, right? You go and you try to partner with the companies where you already think your target audience is going to be working. Uh, and they make, such, they make such good margins on their content already. They make improving margins on their content that subsidizing it here in the early game for the long game, I think is pretty smart. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. I'm with sure. it. All right, I uh, didn't have time to talk about Amazon and Plus AI, but Amazon's getting into the autonomous game uh, with a potential 20% warrant on the shares of Plus AI. That's going to be very interesting to cover. Check out Alan Adler for more on that. But that's been it for episode 75 of Great Quarter, guys. We will be back next week with another big show. We will see you then. Thanks. Thanks.